discretion advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. Outside of the obvious example of O.J. Simpson, allegedly, there aren't many cases of a football player who was drafted to an NFL team and then took a dark path in life, which led them to commit murder. Aaron Hernandez and Sergio Brown being a couple of others. But unfortunately, in the case of Randall Woodfield, this is exactly what happened. And that was because, after spending a short time with the Green Bay Packers in 1974, and ultimately getting cut from the team before he could play a snap, he'd be driven by a self-imposed shame to commit a series of rapes and murders between Washington, Oregon, and California, with the path of destruction he took across the Interstate 5 corridor, leading to him being given the name the I-5 Killer. Randall Woodfield was born on December 26, 1950, into an upper-middle-class family in Salem, Oregon. But while his two older sisters later took the academic path in life, with one becoming a doctor and the other an attorney, Randall was instead far more interested in the world of sports, specifically football. To him, it was a way to express himself and scratch his competitive itch, something he developed while growing up in nearby Otter Rock, a small seaside town around eight miles north of Newport. That said, for as much as he enjoyed being on the gridiron, and for as popular as his talents there made him amongst his peers, there was a far darker inclination Randall had, which he felt unable to control by simply playing football. While still in junior high school, he'd begun exhibiting what would later be described as sexually dysfunctional behaviors. Basically, he had a habit of exposing himself to girls in public. Of course, given how good of a football player he was, his football coaches tried to brush all of this under the rug, so that he could continue playing unhindered. But while this was enough to stop him from being dropped by the team, his parents insisted that he go to therapy. Not that this did very much to get rid of those desires. All it seemed to do was help him to suppress them as he continued to get better and better at football. By the time he got older and transferred to Portland State University in 1970, he was chosen to be the Portland State Vikings starting wide receiver. Still, though, His issues with getting into trouble continued in spite of his success on the field. Later that same year, he was arrested for vandalizing an ex-girlfriend's apartment. And that was minor compared to two years after that, he was booked again, where he once more exposed himself to a group of girls in Multnomah County. So at that point, deciding to jump before he was pushed, Randall dropped out of college before he could graduate. A pretty big blow to his ego but something he ultimately repaired when during the 1974 NFL draft, he was selected by the Green Bay Packers during the seventh round. It was a huge achievement and signaled that big things were in future for the boy from Otter Rock. Unfortunately, though, the next few months didn't exactly play out as he'd planned, because despite having a lot of natural talent, he soon learned that the level of competition in the NFL was on another level to what he'd been used to before. That meant that he was no longer the big fish in the small pond. He struggled and was cut during training camp that February, all before he even got a chance to play a single NFL regular season game. And sure, he would still get to play football on a semi-professional level when he signed with the Manitowoc Chiefs not long after this, but that just wasn't the same. In Randall's eyes, his inability to make it to the Packers' official roster represented a massive failure on his part. And that bred a sense of shame and resentment within him, which quickly mixed with his sexual delinquency issues to create a situation where, just one year later, he had left that semi-pro team in Wisconsin and returned to Portland, beginning a series of robberies and sexual assaults. Several women in the area accused him of holding them at knife point and forcing them to perform oral sex on him. Needless to say, it didn't take long before Randall got caught doing this, And so, when police had him in custody, he'd confessed to his crimes. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, 
with him ultimately being released on parole after four years. That said, it doesn't appear that his time behind bars did anything to rehabilitate him, because pretty quickly after he got out, Randall continued with his wave of rapes, with him now having graduated to outright murdering the women after he was done with them on more than one occasion. The first known victim was Cherie Lynn Ayers, an x-ray technician and an old friend of his from school. He'd met up with her sometime on the evening of October 9, 1980, and after dragging her back to his apartment in downtown Portland and there raping her, he bludgeoned her across the head and stabbed her in the neck. Once Cherie's body was discovered soon thereafter, Randall became a prime suspect because of the fact that he had been known to correspond with Cherie during his time in prison. And the suspicions that he was involved only got worse when he refused to take a polygraph test. Because his blood type didn't match the semen found in the victim at the time, he wasn't formally charged. Instead, he escaped any consequences and picked right back up where he left off by killing an old college acquaintance named Darcy Renee Fix on November 27th of the same year. After that was over, he'd gotten away with murder once again. He began a series of high-profile robberies throughout the Pacific Northwest along the I-5 corridor, with many of the women he came across during these crimes being forced to commit sex acts on him before he let them go. So prolific was he becoming at this point, by January of 1981, police had taken to labeling him the I-5 Bandit, as they were yet to identify him as Randall Woodfield. That said, the moniker of mere bandit wouldn't last for long because by the time mid-February came around, multiple additional women would be victims of Randall's wrath, and four of these would be outright killed. 20-year-old Sherry Lynn Hull, 37-year-old Donnelly Eckhart, 14-year-old Janelle Charlotte Jarvis, and 18-year-old Julie Ann Reitz had all met their ends by February 15th. And on top of that, 20-year-old Susie Bennett, 20-year-old Beth Wilmont, and three additional unnamed women would also be assaulted and left fearful for their lives after their encounters with the former football star. But these are only the confirmed victims, because as many as 44 other murders would later be linked to Randall Woodfield too. Luckily, police were able to stop him before he could do any further damage. On February 28, 1981, a payphone call log was able to show he had made calls from a number of sites near where the murders had taken place, with this being all the evidence that was needed to bring him in for questioning. And while Randall would not confess to any crimes here, a subsequent search of his home revealed enough evidence to charge him with murder, rape, sodomy, attempted kidnapping, armed robbery, and illegal possession of firearms in both Washington and Oregon. Not long after that, he was tried in Salem and ultimately convicted of the murder of Sherry Lynn Hull, with this being enough to put him behind bars even if he hadn't technically been found guilty of the other murders he was almost certainly responsible for. Chris Van Dyke, the district attorney for Marion County at the time of the trial, stated, when asked afterward, quote, Woodfield is the coldest, most detached defendant I've ever seen. And this was the reason the judge presiding over the case ultimately saw fit to sentence him to life in prison plus 90 years. And by the way, Chris Van Dyke is the son of actor Dick Van Dyke. That would not be the end of his sentencing, because later the same year in October, a second trial was held in Benton County, Oregon, and Randall was also convicted of sodomy and weapons charges with all of this adding a further 35 years to his existing sentence. As it stands today, he remains locked up at Oregon State Penitentiary, with it looking highly unlikely he'll ever breathe the breath of freedom again. Could things have turned out differently for both him and his many victims if the butterfly effect had seen his football career thrive rather than end in such disappointment? I suppose it's possible, but there's no way to know, because whether he'd made it to the gridiron or not, he was clearly already a man with multiple deep-rooted issues, and so it's entirely possible he would have found another excuse to kill. That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and I really appreciate you listening. 
If you're new to listening to 10 Minute Murder, welcome. Hit subscribe wherever you're listening right now, and that will more easily help you catch up on all the back episodes of the podcast. Now, keep in mind, if you're listening to this on YouTube, it's audio only, and all of the episodes are not on YouTube. A big bulk of them are on YouTube, but there are many that aren't on YouTube. So find a podcast app that you like. If you use Apple, I would suggest using the Apple Podcasts app. That's a great one. Um, I also use Spotify. I have an Apple phone. I also use Spotify pretty interchangeably. If you're on Android, I don't know what to tell you because I don't know anything about Android phones. I hear they're great. I wouldn't know. But Spotify also works on Android. And there's a host of others, Pandora, uh, many others. But anyway, my point is, if you are listening on YouTube right now, you can listen on any other podcast listening app and you'll get 100% of the episodes. And if you like this episode, leave a rating and review wherever you can, because that helps the show grow. Now, I've been informed recently that I don't give my email address out, but I still manage to read emails from people that listen. How is this possible? Well, it's because I actually do give my email address out sometimes during this part of the podcast, but also it's in the show notes of every episode that I do, and it's on the website as well, but I'll give it again now and make a better effort to mention it in the future. Joe at 10minutemurder.com. Joe has an E, by the way. It's a silent E. Joe at 10minutemurder.com. You can email me questions or comments or anything else. I don't always have time to respond to everyone, but I do read them all. All right, that's it. Thank you for listening to another 10-Minute Murder podcast episode. I'll see you on the next one.